I'm Jerry, not Brandy. If we haven't met, I'm really excited that you're here. I love seeing new faces here, and I won't say old, I'll say returning faces. I love seeing you too. Um, this morning, I'd like to share with you a little bit about community groups and just connection in general. This is called Connection Sunday. As Mike was talking about, we're really excited that you're here, but we want you to get involved, whether that's joining a community group like Randy did, or joining one of our ministry teams. So I personally serve on our video team. We have setup crew. Believe it or not, there's Legos behind this wall, on the wall, because this is an elementary school. And so we have tons of things that happen at this church because of our ministry groups. We'd love for you to join. There's a connection wall out in the courtyard, so check it out after service, okay? Today we got a special message for you. Today we have Ben, Manny, and Brianna. They're going to share a 777 talk with y'all, and it's something really special, so I'm glad you're here. Basically, they're going to give you like a little seven-minute TED talk about the Bible, and I can't wait for you to hear about it. All right, give it up for Ben. Say it louder. Say, Ben, you got seven minutes, because you don't tell me how long I got. I'll take all day. Say, Ben, you got seven minutes. Thank you. See, this is how community acts, right? We keep each other accountable, right? And so that's healthy, right? You're helping me out. So that's actually your first point to the, to the 777 talk is healthy Jesus communities practice. Say practice. practice. Louder. Say practice. practice. Practice love and good deeds. Healthy Jesus communities practice love and good deeds. See, it's more than just connecting on Sunday, right? I grew up, we went to church every Sunday or when I started going to church, it was a while ago. Um, but I didn't understand that there was church outside of Sunday. See, it's more than just when we connect here on Sunday. Connecting, we can connect any day of the week that ends with why. Pretty much every day of the week, right? Because church is bigger than these four walls. Church is so much bigger than these walls. And actually, church is the community that happens outside of these walls. Did you guys know that? The church actually is the community that happens outside of these walls. And the Bible has something to say about this. God actually speaks about community and community groups. Here's actually what the Bible says, and it's our core verse for today. It's found in Hebrews, verse 24 and 25. And y'all could read aloud with me, or you could read in your mind with me. It's fine, but go ahead and read, all right? So it says, starting at verse 24, And let us consider how we may spur one, thank you guys, one another, right? on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, right, as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Did you guys notice anything in that? Huh? There was a lot of, like, we language, right? There's a lot of together language. There's a lot of us language. And see, that's the point that this is, that the, that the writer's pointing out, is that in healthy Jesus communities, like this one right here, right? This is a good example. Clap it up for yourselves. Give yourselves a big clap. You guys are in a healthy Jesus community, right? We, we come together, not just on Sunday, but any day of the week and practice. Say that with me. Practice. Practice love and good deeds. The verses actually say not to give up meeting together, that sounds like meeting up any day of the week, talk to me. Doesn't it sound like that to you, right? It's like the author already knew what was going on, right? And he also highlights that there are two key ingredients to help us practice that spur of growth, love, and good deeds in a healthy Jesus community. One, a relationship with Jesus. That's like the most crucial part. That's what the author really extensively writes down. He's really getting us to understand that we need a relationship with Jesus. That's the most important step. But two, can you guys guess what it is? Just think about it real quick. The second one is you must have a relationship or a connection with a healthy Jesus community. And if you don't, look to your left and then look to your right. Guess what? Now you got connection with your healthy Jesus community. There you go. So if you said you don't got one, you don't got any more excuses, you have one, right? But these are the two ingredients that help us spur. They help us agitate. They help us provoke us. Have you ever been provoked before? Man, right? But being in a healthy Jesus community actually helps agitate, spur, provoke us to love and good deeds. And not only that, a deeper relationship with Jesus. Come on now. Isn't that great? And I like to overemphasize that word practice, right? I mean, because when we come to church, we think we have to be perfect. But we, we overemphasize this word practice on purpose. Ain't none of us Jesus, right? None of us in here walked in like, man, I'm feeling like Jesus today. Myself included. I didn't feel like that, right? 100%. I ain't Jesus. Ask my wife. She'll let you know he ain't walked on water yet, right? So, she, so we know that we ain't Jesus. And guess what? 
We practice, right? Practice means that perfection hasn't been achieved. I love that. God takes that, God takes all that burden off. It's like, you don't got to show up and be perfect. You don't got to do all these things before you come into church. He said, just show up and practice. Show up and practice. And as a church, as a church, as a church and followers of Jesus, we're not perfect at loving and good deeds. I mean, come on. Let's be honest. I ain't perfect at loving good deeds. That's my wife again, right? But we practice. But we practice in these contexts so that way we can get better and better every day. As a matter of fact, did you know Jesus understood the importance of practice? These are actually Jesus' words. He says, but even more blessed are all who hear the word and put it into what? Practice, right? So if Jesus understands practice, then we should understand practice, right? And I know you're probably thinking like, okay, Ben, I get the practice part, but do I really have to join the community? Right? What's the whole point of being in a healthy Jesus community? I'm so glad you thought, and I'm so glad you asked that. Because you guys didn't ask that, huh? But this life we lived, if you didn't know, it's a shared life. Did you know that? That this life we live is a shared life. Following Jesus Christ is not a solitary journey. And my boys from Victory Outreach back in the day, they say, Ben, there are no solo cholos for Christ. There are none. No solo cholos for Christ, man. You need to get with the church. You need to go help out there because there are no solo cholos for Christ. And I think he's absolutely right. Right? But when we, get, when we give our lives to Christ, there are a couple of things. There are several things that happen. One, we go from darkness to light. How great is that? We go from darkness to light. Two, and this one's really good, we go from death to life. So we go from darkness to life, we go from death to life, but then also, this is also my favorite one, we go from isolation to community. We go from isolation to community. The Bible tells us since our beginning of our existence, we were created to be in relationship. We were created to be in a healthy faith, Jesus, community. Let me take you to a scripture to the beginning of our creation. In Genesis 126, we read, it said, God said, God said, ooh, that's pretty important, right? Let us make mankind in our image. There's that we language again, right? Let us make mankind in our image. God created us in his image. When we look around everywhere, we reflect something of God that is so different from the rest of creation. Just like the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are in a healthy faith community, well, guess what? We're also called to be in a healthy faith Jesus community, right? All of us here are connected with others, good or bad, church or non-church. We all have a connection. And that connection, if you didn't know, brings increase in our lives. Whatever we're connected with, we bring increase. The writer points out practicing, say practice, practice. right? Our connections with a healthy Jesus community helps us increase in strength and life. We, we actually increase it in each other, but not only that, it spurs love and good deeds and a deeper relationship with Jesus. Isn't that great, right? Another way we can say this, a more trendy way, is we have influence. You, you have influence in the people around you, and the people around you have influence over you. And it's actually a principle of multiplication. The Bible talks about it. It says, one can chase 1,000, two could put 10,000 to flight. There's a certain amount one person can do. But when there's two people, it's not just doubled, it's multiplied. Yeah. That's why we strongly, here at the front, we strongly recommend and encourage that you start signing up or participate in a community group. That's why we strongly recommend that. All of us are practicing all kinds of things. Some of us are practicing golf, video games, cooking, basketball, parenting, right? How, all, how many of y'all know that parenting is practice? Let me tell you. But do we have a practice mentality when it comes to following Jesus? Do we? If we want to be great at love and good deeds, then we need a healthy Jesus community that we can practice with. Following Jesus is not for solo cholos, and if you're not a cholo, then it's not a solo sport. It's a team sport, one where we get to practice every day and twice on Sundays when we meet on the field, a.k.a. the church, to practice. We're all God's creation. Every single one of you is all God's creation. And in this setting, we practice being God's family. And as we practice within those healthy Jesus communities, guess what happens? Say, Ben, tell me what happens. 
Victory happens, freedom happens, transformation happens, success happens, deliverance happens, breakthrough happens, big dreams happen. All of this happens when we come together in this practice context, right? Practice context, right? This all happens as we practice in a we context, not a me context. See, all of this happens, breakthrough, freedom, deliverance, good things, all this stuff, big dreams, success, God-sized dreams all happen when we practice in a healthy Jesus community. And if you're just making it every Sunday, just getting here, and you're feeling spiritually depleted, depleted, that sounds like it might be a symptom that you might need to help connect more in a healthy Jesus community during the week. I'm going to say that one more time. If you're just making it to Sunday spiritually, could that be a symptom that you might need to practice more in a healthy Jesus community? And when we practice, what happens? We increase love. We increase good deeds. And I'm calling you all to action. It's time to practice, y'all. It's time to practice. And the way we will practice is by signing up for community groups. And I leave you with this. What's that old saying? Practice makes what? Well, the author reminds us that not only does practice make perfection, but actually, in the Bible context, practice propels, presents, promotes, provokes, spurs his presence. Practice provokes his presence. Thus, in a healthy Jesus community, we help spur or influence each other closer and closer to Jesus. And as we continue to practice, say practice one more time. It influences and increases the right things in my life, in your life, in our lives. More Jesus, more life, more hope, more strength, and of course, love and good deeds, y'all. Love you. Hey, uh, my name is Manny. Uh, today we're going to see why Jesus communities have intentional rhythms. We're going to read out of, <laughs> this thing is magnetic. Um, <laughs> so it's going to clip on to <laughs> I'll keep it away. Uh, we're going to read out of Hebrews chapter 10 today. Uh, but before we get into what the Bible has to say about Jesus' communities, I want to give us some context about Hebrews. Uh, the book of Hebrews was written towards Jesus-believing Jews who were on the edge of losing their faith. That may be you this morning. Maybe you're on the edge doubting God's love for you or his existence altogether. Uh, if that's you, I want to encourage you. Great job for being here this morning. It takes a lot of courage to admit that to yourself and to be honest with God. If we read the whole, book, the whole book of Hebrews, what you'll notice is that Hebrews throws a lot of encouragement our way. But this book also gives us a warning. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 through 25, it says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Think of ways to encourage others in love and good works. Do not stop gathering together like others have, but encourage one another. I imagine that the author is saying it like this. Hey, don't lose hope. God is trustworthy. He's a promise keeper. Don't stop gathering together like others have, but encourage one another in love and good works. Why is it that the author points out the other guys? Why couldn't that phrase just be left out of the Bible? Anyone's mom and dad ever pointed out other people's mistakes and consequences to scare you? Like, I remember when I was younger, and my mom and dad are right here. I remember when I was younger, my mom and dad would always be watching the show Scared Straight, and they would always tell, they would always tell my middle brother, hey, you keep going the way you're going, we're going to send you to jail to see, to see how inmates live daily, right? We're, they're trying to scare us, right? Well, I think that the reason the book of Hebrews points out those other guys is because it's implying that those who stop gathering in Jesus' believing communities are the ones most at risk of falling away from their faith. This is why we need to be intentional with our Jesus communities. A couple of weeks ago, Miyang, one of our awesome videographers, interviewed a lot of us. And the question was, uh, what do you love about the Refinery Church so much? And so many of us answered, Oh, the community. I love the community. The community is great. I love that community is such a huge part of who we are as a church. But I want to ask a question that challenges me. Aside from Sunday, how often do we gather with our Jesus-believing communities with the purpose of growing in our faith? 
In Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 43, it says, They, the believers of Jesus, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. Verse 46, Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. The meaningful relationships that lead to spiritual growth, that lead to those signs and wonders that we see in the Bible, to the laughter, to the memories, to, to all that good stuff, only happen when we incorporate intentional rhythms. The early Jesus believers were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to breaking bread. They were intentional with each other. We also need to be intentional. About a year and a half ago, we met some of our now very good friends named Jack and McKenna. Many of you guys know them. Uh, when we first started hanging out, it was, it was a bit awkward. Uh, <laughs> at the time uh, of us hanging out and meeting them, they were the, really the only couple that was uh, mine and my wife's age at the time. So we kind of said, a why not? Um, <laughs> 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 There was, uh, honestly, there was not much to talk about, and you can only ask what it's like where you're from so many times before that conversation goes just south. Uh, we would hang out maybe once or twice more after we met them, and then we'd see them at church on Sundays. Fast forward a few months later, uh, we launched our first round of, of what we call community groups, where we all gather on a weekly basis to learn from the Bible, eat together, and then to pray for each other. This was also super awkward at first because we pretty much exhausted all of our conversations beforehand, right? Um, this is usually where people stop their regular gathering, when it gets awkward, when it gets kind of like you just don't know where to go, right? I promise, even when we launched the community groups, there were moments where it wasn't easy to be intentional. We wanted to use every excuse in the book to not attend this community group. We, we work, we have small children and no babysitter. There was the tension of what if I don't like the group or, or what if they don't like me or, or what if it's just boring? What if I just don't enjoy it? Uh, and honestly, sometimes just flat out just laziness. Oh, man, I just, I just don't want to go today. The point is that we realized intentionality is not easy. It takes a lot of effort. But I promise you guys, every time we met as a community group, we did not regret it. I saw some people in my group grow in their faith. I saw some of the people in my group accept Jesus for the very first time. I saw meaningful and lasting relationships be built during this time. Everything that happened to the Jesus believers in the Bible was happening to us because of the intentional rhythms we were incorporating on a weekly basis. I think about all the rhythms I make time for right now. Golf, uh, my coffee in the morning, time for the boys when my kids are asleep. Um, maybe for you it's a girls' night. Uh, maybe it's the gym or a Sunday, a Sunday night football game. These are all rhythms that, that we intentionally carve into our day to make life just a little bit more enjoyable. So why not intentionally carve out some time for our Jesus communities? I encourage all of us to listen to the Bible when it says, don't stop gathering together. Push past the awkward and the uncomfortable moments. We want to experience the promised blessing of meaningful relationships and spiritual growth and the better relationship with God, right? Then we need to be intentional with our gatherings just like we are with everything else. Without intentional rhythms with the people in our lives, our relationships will never develop to the caliber of those that we see in the Bible. The encouragement that you receive from others is going to be super limited. And the opportunity for you to encourage others, it will also be limited. And your limited, uh, your limited time will eventually re result in some really lonely moments. And loneliness is where the enemy draws us away from God. I leave you with this challenge. Be intentional with your Jesus communities. Make a goal for yourself or your spouse to push past the awkward and the uncomfortability. Study the Bible together, worship together, serve together, eat together, go to church together. This is the type of intentionality that leads to spiritual growth and christ and their lifelong friendships. Our third point today is healthy Jesus communities spur and encourage one another. We're going to read Hebrews 10.24 again because the more we read it, the more it gets in here. So let's go. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. The word spur means to incite to action. And when we think about spurs, we often think of 
cowboy boots. I have a slide here. I think they're going to throw up. That is a spur. Side note on cowboys. Growing up, my brother, who was much younger, loved all things cowboy. And my family thought it would be really cool for all of us to dress up like cowboys and cowgirls. We had Knott's Berry Farm annual passes. And you can imagine my horror as a 13-year-old being paraded in cowboy wear with my family. Of course, every photo that you look back at that time is like me in like biker shorts and a t-shirt. I just refused. And so even now, I still have an issue with cowboy wear, but that's a whole nother story. So the cowboys, they wear spurs. So when they press their legs into the body of a horse, the metal bits touch the horse and force it to react the way that they want. Go to the right, go to the left, go forward go backward. That's how they control the horse or to change direction. And the book of Hebrews in the New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Greek word for spur, I want you to say this with me, this is so fun, such a fun word, paroxysmos, right? Paroxysmos. Isn't that a great word? It is used for an incitement to good or an irritation to anger. It's not a comfort word. You're not like, oh, yes, paroxysmos. It's not a comfort word, okay? I love that, though, in terms of relationships because great relationships have heart, but like spurs, they also have teeth. When Jesus was alive and walking the earth, he showed such incredible tender love towards people, but he also showed tough love. So we're going to look at three examples of where Jesus shows tough love love. So the first is in Matthew 21, 12 through 13. So I'm going to kind of sum it up for us because of time purposes, but Jesus goes in and he casts all the merchandisers out of the temple grounds. And you're like, why are there merchandisers in the temple? And that's a good question. It was because they were profiting off of people's desire to worship God. Because back then you couldn't give Roman currency to God in the Jewish temple. That was a no-no. And so they would come and they would have to change their money for temple shekels. And so when they did this, these guys, they were making bank, upcharging people. It's kind of like when Victor and I go to Mexico, it's like one side of the board, the exchange rate's great, and the other side, you're like, dang. You know, that's what they were doing to people. Also, people would sacrifice animals like doves. And so they started a racket with the priests where the racket was that they would like put their seal of approval on there. Like this is a, this is a priest approved dove and they would charge extra. And so they had this whole side job going. And so Jesus comes in and he does not mess around. And he shows tough love. He's like overturning tables. And we read that and we're like, Jesus had anger management issues. No, Jesus did not have anger management issues. And he's not encouraging to, you to overturn tables either. He does it because these people needed to be reminded that God's house was not a house of profit. It was a house of worship. The second example is in Matthew 16, 21 through 23. I'm going to sum this one up too. But Jesus tells his disciples that he has to suffer. He has to go to the cross. He's going to die and he's going to rise again. He pretty much tells them the whole playbook for what's going to happen. And his disciple, Peter, who was so full of just zeal and excitement, he tells Peter, he's like, no, Lord. No, that's not going to happen. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Like, get behind me. Now, I don't recommend responding to people this way. So the next time you're in a disagreement with your spouse or with a good friend, you know, don't be like, hey, get behind me, Satan. Okay? We're not encouraging that here at the refinery church. Um, but what happens here is Peter is basically telling Jesus, you know what? The hard way? Like, no. Take, take the easy way. And when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan... He is identifying that idea as coming from Satan. Because Satan's way, even when Jesus was tempted in the desert, was to say, hey, you don't need this. You don't need to do this the hard way. Do it the easy way. And so Jesus always called out wrong thinking and anything that came against the word of God. In society today, we think that that's just being obnoxious. But actually, that's a biblical principle. When we see something that's not biblical, that's not right, we are supposed to call it out. 
The last example is in Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And Jesus gives us a how-to for dealing with sin in the church. Um, This is an entirely other message that we won't have today. But the point here is that Jesus is never in the business of looking the other way. That is not what Jesus does. He is all about accountability. But what is key is that it has to happen in relationship. It has to happen in relationship. Because correction without relationship, that becomes criticism. How many of you guys have been on the end of a relationship that had no relationship, but it had a lot of feedback, a lot of negative feedback? You can't, someone explained it to me like this, you can't make a withdrawal from a bank until you make some deposits. So we can't go in and correct people unless we are doing life with them. We have absolutely no business correcting them. So that's an encouragement for community groups. You know, if you're like, dude, I have some things to say to some people, join a community group first. Build some relationships. But those deposits, they come in the form of encouragement. Let's look at Hebrews 10, verse 25 together again. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I'm going to give you another Greek word. That Greek word for encourage is parakleo. Parakleo. It's a word that means comfort. That's where the comfort is. Jesus uses the same word in Matthew 5, 4 when he says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. They will be be parakaleoed. Healthy Jesus relationships, they comfort and they call out. They do both. And being part of a healthy Jesus community here at the Refinery Church means we put ourselves in the position to receive and to give correction and comfort. That's what being part of a healthy Jesus community means. This can't happen in isolation. Victor and I have a friend, our friend Broski, and he refers to this as geographic proximity. I want you to think about this in terms of dating. You can't sit at home eating Cheetos and watching the Hallmark Channel and believe that the man of your dreams is going to knock on the door with your pizza. Like, It doesn't happen that way. It would be cool if it happened that way. Maybe it's happened that way for you and someone's going to be like, I have a testimony. But that's a whole other thing. Um, But it takes risk. It takes being brave to put yourself out there. It takes putting yourself in an environment to have geographic proximity to another person. Why do it? Why should I be a part of a community group? Because what you have learned can spur others, and what you have experienced in your life can help comfort someone else. I was at an event the other night talking to a girl, and she, she was walking through something that I had walked through many years ago. And I was able to share and to minister to her and connect because I had walked through something difficult. There is a whole spectrum of difficulties that have been walked through and conquered and found victory in the name of Jesus in this room. And when you all get in a room together, it's like swapping. You're just like swapping victory. You're like, oh my gosh, let me tell you how you can get through this. You want to know how to get through this? Here you go. Let me tell you. Um, When I was in my early 30s, I stopped living in community. I was going through a particularly difficult season in my life, and I felt that I didn't need a community group anymore. I was over it. I had attended young adults groups for years, and I had been there, and I had done that. And, and then I met Victor, and we ended up at the same church on the worship team. And Victor had this group that he had started with some friends of his called The Gathering. And he was very passionate about it, and he felt that I should come. He was like, come, come hang, come hang, you know, in his very, like, cool Victor way that's nonchalant and yet so persistent. And so I was like, thanks, but no thanks, you know, not interested. And God used Victor to literally bug the living daylights out of me until I went. He was like, I'll pick you up. Now, he said I'll pick you up, but he didn't even have a vehicle at the time. No vehicle. 
he borrowed our youth pastor's giant red expedition and pulled up in front of my family's house. And he was like, hey, I'm here. Let's go. And I had a very big, <laughs> I had a very big decision to make at that moment. A very big decision. And it was, I got in the car. I got in the car. I got in the car and I ended up married. Like, you don't know. <laughs> Whoa, you don't know. You know, your future husband could be in a community group. I'm just saying, you know. But seriously, some of the best relationships I have had in my life came out of getting in that car. I have friendships and people that I worship with and, and encourage me and pray with me over the phone, even though we don't see each other every day, that came out of that group. And looking back, I'm so grateful for all the things that God brought into my life, including being married to Victor, because I got in the car. God is saying to you today, get in the car. Say it, get in the car. <laughs> Say yes. Go outside today after service and go to that community group wall and like scan that QR code, you know? Get in there, do it. I'm not naive to think that you may have been hurt by a church community group or a church community. I have. And getting in community again with another group of people absolutely terrifies you. Victor and I have been there. But when we build walls of protection around our hearts, they don't just keep people out, they keep God out too. And so if we want to experience him every day, those walls that we've built up for protection, they have to come down. God wants to come in and he wants to remove the obstacles and he wants to heal the hurts. He can do that. Do you believe he can do that today? He's done it for me. He can do it for you. And here we go, that whole cycle of my story and what I've walked through encouraging you. And you have a story that's going to encourage someone else. If that's you and you have experienced church hurt and it's keeping you, it's holding you back from experiencing healthy Jesus community, I want you to pray with me right now. Because I believe that Jesus is going to break that today. And you can repeat it after me out loud if you want, or you can do it in your heart. Either way. It works. Um, but we're going to take it to Jesus because he wants to do something about that today. So, dear Jesus, I thank you that you know and understand what it is to be betrayed by those you were closest to. I bring you my hurt. I break off any lies I have believed about myself or about others because of that hurt. And I renounce the judgments I've made about myself and about others, those who have hurt me. Break down the walls I have built to keep people out. Set me free today to live in community with you and with others. In Jesus' name, amen. If we could have the worship team come up. I want to say something else. Um, before we say yes to community, we've talked a lot about church community. But before we do that, it's so important that we've said yes to Jesus first. You may be here for the first time and you've never known Jesus and you're like, well, I'm going to do life with all these people that love this person that I don't know, and that's weird. Jesus is like, hey, I'm here. I want to do community. I want to do life with you.